welcome to Profiling with Trey, an epic show, epic series, bringing to you the latest in cannabis information. We're bringing together the community, a community of people, advocates, entrepreneurs, business people, anyone who wants to impact the cannabis community in a positive way. Profile is here to highlight you. Again, my name is Trey. Thank you so much for joining me. We have an epic show for you. I'm being joined by two wonderful guests telling their own stories. We have one specific story that I know you're going to be exceptionally like just grateful for us to share this one. We'll be tuning in and just talking to um, Vivian Wilson. She's a entrepreneur, a young, black, beautiful woman who is the CEO, founded the Greenport Re Cannabis Retail Store. And she's here with us on Profiling with Trey. Hey, Vivian, how are you doing? I'm good, Trey. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Good to have you on the show. You know, Vivian, let me just go right into it. You are an epic, you have an epic story. You are now uh, a cannabis license holder, a cannabis retail license holder. And I see that you're sitting That's in your retail store. I'm wondering why is it that your store is not open as yet? I know you have a wicked story to share with everybody as to why is it you're, you know, you don't have customers walking through the doors. And I mean, I know COVID is, is there, but there is a breakdown with just the process and the procedures and you're going to walk us through that you know vivian go into it why why is it that your store is not op open or has been opened since op since um you got your your store well the the main reason goes back to the um licensing process that the alcohol and gaming commission the agco currently has AGCO. in place mm -hmm. Yeah, and this process that they have highly favors large corporations. And so small operators like myself are waiting 253 days or more to open up mm -hmm. a single store, whereas large players can open, are able to open multiple stores on a monthly basis. Wow. Now, again, that whole unfair advantage, you know, the big stores, the, the big corporations, they have a lot of money. They have a lot of capital. And, you know, for small businesses coming up, you know, we necessarily we don't have the, the big, um, you know, pool of capital and resources to tap into. And, you know, it's just you having this one store and reaching where you are right now. And, you know, hearing the information that you have 200, uh, well, yeah, you're waiting up to 253 days to get this store open. I can't imagine how, you know, demotivating, um, you know, how haven't you given up already? What, what's, what's driving you? Well, the main reason why I haven't given up is because when we look back at the history of cannabis in Canada and the groups that have been um, heavily impacted by the criminalization of it, I realized that we needed to have a completely different experience. We need to, I needed to be the change that I wanted to see. You know, mm -hmm. I look back at as a child or as a um, growing up in Westmoreland, Jamaica, and from a very young age, I learned about the healing properties of the plant. When mm -hmm. I came to Canada, that narrative was dramatically different. And as a teenager, I was horrified when I, often would see on the TV screen that the people being paraded across the screen, criminalized for their association with the plant, looked a lot like me. Mm -hmm. But in 2018, mm -hmm. when the narrative started changing in Canada and around the world, the people being paraded across the TV screen, this time celebrating, raising millions or billions of dollars or getting mm -hmm. their companies added to the Toronto Stock Exchange, looked nothing mm -hmm. like me. And in that moment, I realized that there had to be a different narrative. There has to be a different yeah. story. And if I wanted to see this change, I had to be the change that I needed to see. And that's why I got involved in the cannabis industry. Well, first of all, you know, you know, you, you tapped on the point that you're coming from Jamaica. You're coming from Westmoreland. And I want all of our viewers to just know something about Westmoreland. No, no, I'm not going to tell them. Vivian. We know that what comes from West, the, the? Uh, some of the, the best. best ganja comes out of Westland. All, right. That's All right. right, there you go, there you go. The <laughs> best come from West, guys. So if you're heading to Jamaica, you're heading down Montego Bay, the West Side, you're heading down to Negril, guys. Negril, yeah. Tell anybody, say to anybody, the best come. They'll tell you the best come from West. 
So, right. you know, Vivian, you, I, girl, you have the know-how. You, obviously, you have the roots connected to the, to the product itself, to the plant itself. And um, in you coming to Canada and just experiencing seeing this, well, in 2018, you're seeing this whole shift of, um, you know, the, the, just how people look at the plant, the, the connotation of it. And, um, you know, people are, are currently seeing the plant as a money maker and not necessarily, right. not necessarily the, 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 the main need and the path that the plant was for. So, and I mean, right. you know, we know, I know we have to make money and, and survive, but, you know, teaching what the plant is all about and just the roots and culture of it, I, I kind of get that that's where you, you want to push. Am I right? Well, definitely. Um, definitely. That's what Greenport represents, right? We're taking you back to the roots. We're, we're recognizing the history of this plant. We're celebrating the people that first introduced this plant to the world. Um, mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we build a community where everyone can feel welcomed. We're not just yes. here to sell you a product. We're here yeah. to demystify and destigmatize any association with the plant because I'm sure, Trey, you can understand that as someone who's also Jamaican, that there's a lot of stigma um, oh, yes. for a long time associated with yep. us being um, being seen a as mm -hmm. right of that illegal market without just simply because of where we're from or what we look like. Yep. So just yeah. breaking down that stigma, I think, is very important to bring people back to this plant. And you have to take it back to the roots so that people can remember that this wasn't something that started in 2018. No, you know, the research no. that's being done on this plant didn't just start two years ago. This started back in 1400 BC, where you have cultures from India, from China, that actually were Africa. the first users. Mm -hmm. Africa mm -hmm. that were the first mm -hmm. users of this plant. They were the first researchers, the first doctors, the first herbalists, as we would call oh, it, yes. right? Uh, the first, the first spiritualists. Uh, mm -hmm. the, exactly. And we were some of the first patients. Like in Jamaica, um, elders would give the tea, the ganja tea to kids who, um, who had asthma to help cure yes. their asthmatic conditions. And even, now researchers are catching up. Mm -hmm. Even, Even cat cataract. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's One of a the big first thing. Like, growing, growing up in Jamaica, you know, I hear, I mean, we know the negative connotation. It was criminalized in Jamaica. It was fully, you know, illegal. But, you know, using the plant itself in other ways, in medicinal ways, that was always promoted. So, you know, my, my parents, my grandma, you know, nobody wanted you to smoke the herb. But using it for medicinal, using it for cataracts, using it for asthma, um, other people got headaches, I know women with menstrual cramps, all of that stuff. I mean, all of this has to be, you know, go through a regulation and policies. But for the most part, this information has been just all over Jamaica and, you know, spreading, sp selling cannabis and pushing the product now here in Canada. We're not only doing it for the quote unquote recreational fun part of it. It's it's right. something to learn about, you know, the reason why we are even doing this 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 podcast, this, this show, is to spread the education in an entertaining way. So edutainment is is what we're doing here and, and I know that what that's what Green are doing. But no, right. Vivian, I want to I want, you know, I, I see we're having such a wonderful conversation, but I want us to go into the meat of, you know, why me and you um connected. I saw I saw an article um, that my, my producer, well, my, my brethren, Phil, and he's my producer. You guys should reach out to him. I'll give you the information after. But he, he posted an article uh, about you, Vivian, and he basically stated that you got an extend. Uh, after many extensions, you got another letter to wait another 90 days. And many other um, cannabis retailers were being opened during that time. I know COVID slowed down a lot of things, but for the most part, I've seen retail shops open in that time frame, and you're still getting a, you still received a letter stating you have another 90 days, which I think it puts you into September, in mid-September, the end of September. 
um, and you've reached out to, you wrote letters, you know, asking why is it that you are being delayed to open your store? I know you reach out to Premier Doug Ford and, you know, many other, other the, the political uh, regulators. But um, what was that 90 day? Tell, tell me a little bit about that, that second letter and then, you know, it extending to 90 days. Well, I mean, going through the um, AGCO process, and since since that article uh, went out, I've had a lot of other small operators reach out to me, and they had the exact same experience. Um, there is absolutely zero transparency when you're going through the licensing process with the AGCO. You submit your application, and it goes on someone's, and it just goes into the abyss, so to speak. You're, mm. you fo I would follow up with them on a weekly basis to a ask, you know, what's the turnaround time? When can I open my store? When is my application going to be reviewed? And you got the same information that we don't have access to this data, which is absolutely incorrect. Every single government agency has a minimum amount of data that they must collect because this information mm -hmm. Um, must be able to be provided during the Freedom of Information Act if that request does public. come. Mm -hmm. so for the mm -hmm. public, exactly. So yeah. they have this information, but they refuse to share this with share. people who mm -hmm. are spending um, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get into the industry. Um, wow. But the main thing that I realized, though, is that the, the AGCO is not meeting by any means their mandate, which is that they have to guarantee or part of their mandate is fair access and right mm -hmm. now the process that they've developed highly favors large corporations when you pull just looking at the data that they have available on their website you could see that the stores that have been authorized to open 60 percent mm -hmm. of those stores are owned by like 15 corporations 35 mm -hmm. percent are, are owned by around five corporations and that's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then and then what's even more startling is that these companies have another 100 applications plus in the pipeline. Wow. So when you as a small mm -hmm. operator or myself put in mm -hmm. our application, we're Lost going in into sauce. 100. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We're a 101. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, oh. these stores have already controlled 60 percent of the market and yet they have another 100 applications. Wow. And the AGCO doesn't have any process in place to um, ensure oh. fair access. I've spoken to a couple of their directors already in writing, and it's the same story. They actually believe that their process is fair as it is, even though they finally admitted in one of their letters back to me that they've heard the same complaint, they've heard the same feedback over and over oh. again, but they're turning, and really no turning change. a blatant blind eye to it. Yeah. Still no change. Wow. I mean, uh, you know, we, we, we met before this, we spoke before this, this um, sit down, mm -hmm. Vivian. And you know, I told you that I'm coming from corporate. I was with one of the major, you know, retail store lines and I uh, was a brand manager there. Open, launched quite, you know, over 30 stores with them uh, across Canada. Uh, we right. opened one, one of the hot ones was in Hamilton. So I have a lot of, you know, experience there and I know how just, um, so it's it's not easy, but it, it it seems way more easier to get access to opening our stores, um, getting you know the inspection, everything. The process seems much easier than what you've shared with me. It's it's not in compar nothing in comparison to to your experience. Um, you know, being in the corporate world, it somewhat is is much smoother. And I'm happy I'm happy to to speak with you. I didn't even know that this it was not fair. It was not an equal um, playing field with, you know, for anybody who wants to, to access or anybody who has the license to open the store. So this, this itself, I'm happy that we have this, this road, this channel to, to, you know, tell it to the world. And I want to implore, you know, just anybody who is listening right now, if, you know, they want to reach out to us, they want to, you know, give some support, give some feedback, um, you know, we, we will be connecting and, and looking forward to uh, at least having some conversations there. But Vivian, I want to, add yeah. someone else to our talk. I want to just jump in. I have a special guest with us. Uh, he has a decade, over a decade experience in the uh, cannabis industry. Um, well, the sector, because it wasn't an industry as yet. Uh, we, we're now being joined by co-chair of Tarkin Maine's LLP Cannabis Law Group and chair of its franchise law group, 
Matt Mara. Uh, he provide. Uh, are you here with us, Matt? I'm here with you, Trey. How are you? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Thank, thanks for joining the show, brother. Thanks for having me. Excellent, excellent. No, Matt, I mean, your background, it's it's pretty huge. You've provided business regulation advice for a wider range of um, just, you know, clients. You've you know, guided everybody, p people to get their license, obtain their license across the country. You have a big, just vast amount of knowledge on the Cannabis Act and all the predecessor legislation. Have you ever heard any um, story that's you know somewhat similar to what Vivian is going through right now? Sure, you know Vivian's not alone. There's a lot of people that don't think the process is transparent. They don't think it's moving fast enough. They think it favors big companies over the mom and pops. And, and you know when you look at a system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you look at the results, the results being has already, uh, you know, I can see why people get that, that perspective. And, you know, Vivian said something interesting, I thought that was, you know, the AGCOs looked at the system and they think it's fair, even though mm -hmm. they've received similar complaints. And, you know, it, it gets me wondering, you know, maybe they do think it's fair and I'm, I'm sure they do. Um, mm -hmm. But it raises more fundamental questions about sort of the system and the systemic nature of the system. And is it, you know, unconsciously slanted in favor of companies that have money and resources, expensive ops, so mm -hmm. is, who don't have those resources and who can't weather the storm as long or the delay as long to sit there and wait and wait for their store to open. So it's it's not something, this isn't anything new uh, for me mm -hmm. to hear about. We have lots of clients applying for store licenses. Um, even, and we act for small business owners as well as these bigger companies. The bigger companies mm -hmm. are frustrated too, um, believe it or not. I can't even imagine. They have some, mm -hmm. they have some stores, but you know they have you know, designs as well. They're frustrated with the process. So. I, yeah, and they I have hear capital. They, they have the big capital sitting on, so they're they're covered. Now, I mean, Matt, with your expertise, I mean, you know, we're real people living in a real world, and you know, we're trying to to make the best. Uh, I, I mean, with the panel, you know, with Vivian here, you here, you guys are two examples of, of just people who are coming up in the world, and you guys have have ambition, you guys have a passion. And you guys are working to, to for success. No, you know, if that's itself a, a wide playing field of, for people who share that passion, why is it that um, it, it's un, why is it so biased for you know small business or the regular man? Why is it money? Is it is, is it money is that us you know follow the money? Is it the trail of the money? Is that the big factor again? Or or is it that you yeah. know we have a we have a probably as a, a path where only certain people should get access only certain um i guess certain uh, political is, is it do you see it as favoring or i mean is, is it or is just the money is a money thing because if vivian had money or she had millions of dollars is it that it would have worked out or what do you think we're working with here um i think if, if vivian had more money you know she'd probably might be in a better position because there's, uh, you know, she could have, uh, and I don't know the particulars about when she applied or how she applied, but more money gives you more ability to do more things, whether that's prepare in advance for the application, get multiple locations locked up, hire people to um, work on things for you. Um, you know, if you're working a full-time job while trying to open this business, following up with women on a daily basis, Easy when you've got other responsibilities. So part of me starts to to wonder whether the system, you know, was properly thought. Through. And and we see this a lot in cannabis, which is the government comes up with a system and some ideas on this is how promotion should work, this is how licensing should work. And then when we go out into the real world and we mm -hmm. implement these things, we start seeing the cracks. And you know. And and how that impacts certain groups and certain people over at the expense of others, so to speak. So you know, you you'd really have to have a real serious, deep discussion to figure out why is the system set up like that, and well, is there a better way that is more 
equitable way and more fair across all kinds of demographics to allow um, access to, to retail licenses? Well, like, well, those are the questions that we're answering here. And I mean, uh, Vivian, you, I mean, you're a small business owner. You're a female entrepreneur. You're coming up in, a, in an industry right now against a lot of big players. I mean, there are other independent business people out there who are, you know, coming out with their retail stores. Uh, is it that we need more, is that you would need more access to resources? I mean, based on what Matt just said, if, if, is it that we need more money to spend? Do we need more, do you need more people in your corner? Um, do you need the big lawyers? What, what is it that would be, you know, somewhat of a solution and, and the reason to, to bring you to the forefront? <laughs> Well, I definitely, one of the pieces that, um, that Matt said, I, I 100% agree with it. It's really the government, you know, goes into their, their boardrooms and they make decisions without really knowing the impacts of those decisions. So just taking a step back, I've committed myself full time to this industry. I completed all of my own applications. Um, the process for me to get a license was relatively simple because um, of this how I've structured the company I'm the only um, owner of it so and I've been through the federal um, process already so I'd already mm -hmm. gone through a lot of the security clearances so the only gotcha. delay for gotcha. me was just waiting was that my paperwork was submitted very early on January 9th it, the free market opened January 6th and for three months I just waited and I waited for someone for the application wow. to be assigned to someone. Um, the were, you, officer, were, you, were you incurring expenses and you know paying your rent and having the store and the spot and uh, where are, are you currently you know incurring all of that expense right now? So during that waiting period, that's when you're you're really starting to structure the business. So figuring out, um, trying to make operational decisions, trying to make financial decisions without having any guide as to when this road is gonna end. When is this journey even really gonna, gonna start? So that's when I started structuring it um, during that time and consistently reaching out to the AGCO for any updates, which nothing was given. Uh, the frontline staff, my eligibility officer that I worked with was very helpful. She asked me when she, I, when she finally got my application, it was two clarification questions that she asked and that was it. And then I, I waited again. Um, so it's what I think and where I would, you know, definitely agree with Matt is that if the, the system is designed by the decision makers don't look like the end user. So if the decision makers don't look like the end user, then how can they build a system that fits they have the, the experience? End user? Yeah, right, because they don't have that experience. They don't have that that um, knowledge. And even if I'm, I'm sure I, I've worked in government, so they're going to say, well, we get input from stakeholders. But that input could end up on the cutting room floor, because if they yeah. don't understand how that input is going to connect the dots from A to Z, because this is not a part of their experience. They don't understand the industry. They don't understand the challenges when it comes to access. Um, then there's no way for these decision makers to truly understand the impacts of the processes that they're developing. And that hey, goes you know, all the way hey. from the federal to the provincial side of things. I think, I mean, Matt, what do you think on this? I think every corporation, every political regulator body should have a person or a representative, an advocate, someone who has experience who is validated, who, you know, who has years in the, 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 the watching the industry come up. So it's not only, uh, you know, a, a, a pocket money, you know, beneficial only to the pocket, but for long term and the end user and just building, I mean, you know, in my opinion, with COVID-19, with everything that has happened in the past, you know, couple of months, Guys, we're seeing a, a vast change in, in all the industries that already exist. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think even for we to have this conversation, I would implore our regulators and our decision makers to listen to some of these, you know, these suggestions and advice and, and put people, put people with, with experience or put faces that, you know, Vivian would see and say, okay, 
they're getting you know information from somebody who is valid so you're not only seeing somebody who you cannot relate to or you're not only seeing white collar people handle the, make the decisions but you know that they're having talks or matt i mean do you think it would be you know better for more open conversation you know between lawyers and you know political decision makers and business owners do you think I mean, we're kind of doing it right now, but do you think having more discussion in that would be a big solution? Yeah, like it's, look, we're talking about a complicated problem and a complicated solution, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. And it doesn't mean, yeah. I think part of the, the frustration is, and I, I get it on a, almost a daily basis, talking to the AGCO on behalf of our clients and other regulators, not just the AGCO, um, you know, okay, well, why did Vivian not hear anything for three months or, or whatever the case might be? Why did no one speak to her? Why is it mm -hmm. that she had to wait another 90 days? Why is it that when you call, you can't get an update as to where things are at? And if there was a more open dialogue, um, mm -hmm. it might help to to alleviate this you know perception of unfairness that people see because all they see is i applied months are going by no one can tell me anything i've paid a lot of money for this um what's going on and even even now you know there's the the real hold up for vivian is they're only doing five inspections a week and they did announce early on that that was their intention but mm -hmm. there's been no recent announcement as to why they're sticking to that. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of people just waiting to be opened and all they need is an inspection. So maybe there's a very good reason why those inspections can't be more than five a week. But just tell us, talk to us, um, yeah. you know, and let us know. And, and I think everything, you know, it, it's been a real, as everyone knows, a real crazy time in the world the last, mm -hmm. you know, four or five months you know, have the discussion, have the, have the dialogue instead of um, just adhering to the system that's been designed. And maybe they're making changes internally as a result of things that they're hearing, but without that discussion, no one knows that those changes are afoot and it just seems like more of the same. Right. Hey, let me tell you, man. Um, Vivian, I want to, you know, based on what Matt just said, I want, I'm not sure if we went through the timeline um, for our viewers and our listeners to just understand exactly how long you've been waiting. Now, you mm -hmm. set out on, on this journey, I think, what, 200, over 200 days ago. Am I right? Uh, almost 200 days ago, yeah. Almost 200 days ago. And you have another probably over, probably over 50 days to, to, to add to that. No, I'm just starting that process itself and, and, and being to, to, to hear. Has it, I mean, we know the roadblocks were there. Has anything beneficial happened? Has, I mean, have you seen any green light? Has anything, have, have you seen any positive movements? Are we still at that date, that locked in date, you know, two, you know 200 odd days away? You know, I've got, so I went through my inspection already, passed my inspection on the first day, because like I said, I've been through Good. the federal side, so I understand Great. the security requirements of it. So I worked with my <laughs> security tech and I got the cameras in knowing exactly what um, needed to be done. So it was done that day. The 90 days is just a waiting process. The extra 90 days that happened after the security wow. clearance is just, um, you're in the queue and we're waiting for uh, your date to to open. Um, all I was given was that it's mid-September. That's all the mm -hmm. AGCO provided me with, uh, all the information the AGCO pri provided me with. When the Toronto wow. Sun report, um, reached out to them, they told the Toronto Sun September 28th or 29th. They still haven't reached out to me. I don't know what my date <laughs> is. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, so, hold on one second. <laughs> So hold on, you heard about your opening date through right. a public magazine, through a public newspaper. <laughs> that's correct, yeah. yeah. Wow, wow. Hey, Matt, would you say that there's a big breakdown in, um, just breakdown in communication there? Wouldn't you say, Matt? Well, well, therein lies the problem, right, Trey? Like, you know, Vivian's got a store, she's, and, and she's not alone, right? And that's, that's 
I don't mean to take anything away from her situation, no, but it's, it's, yeah. it's more to amplify that this is not a, an isolated incident. And you've got people who are sitting there and saying, Are, my store's ready, everything's good. I'm waiting on you for the green light to open. Why is it gonna be September 28th when it's, when it's July, June, whatever it was when you got the date? Um, mm -hmm. and, and no one has come out and really said, you know, they said we're only doing five a week and they kind of just leave it at that. And it's not necessarily the, the AGCO. It could be the OCS with supply issues. It could be the provincial government that just says, we're only doing five a week, but none of them have said, you know, sorry guys, we're doing five a week. Here's why we're doing five a week. And we're gonna continue to do that. At least then we would know what the rationale is. Um, mm -hmm. But government is very cautious. And in some cases, I don't say secretive, but you know, not forthcoming with information. Oh, I know for mm -hmm, a fact, mm -hmm. not forthcoming with information that they have. And I think, you know, it's 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 one thing on its own to have to wait many months for a license when there's nothing else for you to do um, yeah. except wait because we've done it. Mm -hmm. It's another thing on top of that to not get any information about why that's the case. It, it basically compounds the original problem. And, you know, it doesn't, maybe if the explanation came out and it was still September 28th, that's not gonna fix the financial issues. It's not gonna fix the challenges, but at least nope. if there's a rational reason, um, it, it gives Vivian some understanding and it might also mm -hmm. give her the ability to go out and advocate more and, um, and, and you know, if, if for example, and this is completely hypothetical, but if the yeah. AGCO said, no, the provincial government will not let us license more than five a week, Vivian could then say, great, I'm gonna go to the provincial government and see about getting that changed and, and knows where to go to um, exo-democratic rights. And without having that information, it just leads mm -hmm. to frustration and, and confusion and misunderstanding. Hey, based on that, you know, just going going out and, you know, continue seeking new opportunities or new connections to, to open the store quicker. I mean, I've known I've known about collaborations and Vivian, you can you can address this also. I've known about collaborations with, you know, license holders from big brands. And, you know, let's for example, you got the license and then a big brand would reach out to you, purchase it, and then boom, your, your store would, would have started. Is there a reason why you, you didn't take that direction, or you did, did you know about that um, business model that exists? Um, yeah. Is there a reason why you, you stayed independent? Um, I really, you know what, Trey? Um, for me, a lot. I wanted to bring a, a authentic experience to the industry, mm -hmm. to this market, to the community that we're inviting into our store. And in order for me to do that, I had to remain independent, um, you know, and also when you're looking at experiences working with large corporations that are heavily funded, a lot of the times they don't necessarily see an independent operator as someone that's bringing value to the table because they believe mm -hmm. that what they're bringing is money and that's more valuable. So they tend mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. undermine what it is that you're doing, undermine what it is mm -hmm. that you're, um, how you're approaching things. And they Building. tend to create Building. more of a cookie cutter approach to um, how they're delivering that, you know, cannabis experience. But for me, yeah. I needed, I wanted to, to, like I said, take it back to the roots. And a huge part of that really um, required us to be honest and to yeah. tell the true story of the plant. And a lot of times when you're pushing um a different agenda that's not mm -hmm. necessarily important and for me that was extremely critical that we're mm -hmm. we're creating an authentic um experience here at greenport and that's why i chose to be completely independent um i i think that if we just have a lot of the exact same stores um selling the exact same products the end mm. users will what a just boring. continue mm. to continue to buy where they're currently buying. What, um, what a boring thing that would be, man! Every exactly. shop you go to, you get the same, you get the same plate of food, Matt. 
<laughs> anyway, it, you know, and right every, now the product line mm -hmm. isn't that diverse to begin with. So then you're getting the exact exactly. same product, the exact same experience. Then what's the point, right? So, so service, that's what we're the service. Mm -hmm. The service right. is where that difference has to be. Mm -hmm. I totally respect and, that. I totally respect yeah. that. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, sir. Here's no, no, no. That's oh. what I was saying. Oh. That for us, that's and for me, that's what was extremely. Um, important especially when i look at my experience with the plant and how because of the criminalization of it i chose to disassociate myself completely yeah. for many years yeah. because of just that fear of being of losing my freedom right because there's a yeah. higher risk of me losing my freedom than um and and those from racialized communities than others within this country so i really thought it was very important to focus on and to make those communities feel like they can be a part of this industry, they can be a part of this change. Yeah. And the only way for me to do that was to tell my story and tell it in my own authentic and true way. Yeah. Hey, let, let me tell you how, you know, guys, you may just segue quickly into how, you know, me, you and Matt here, Vivian, we're, we're sitting down. You know, I saw your story on LinkedIn and I reached out to, to Phil and I said, Phil, we have to help this girl. We have to help her. We have to broadcast this to the world. I, I, I'm going to share it on my LinkedIn, but it doesn't feel like it's going to impact anything when I share it on, you know, a social media platform. I, I want and 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 the sharing. I wanted to create something where we have some low talk, you know, we we make some noise and we have, you know, brilliant people like Matt come in and give their insight and and, and give some experience on, you know, how he's he's seeing it it turn out and um how the future can be if we have these this if, if we have these conversations and continue having these discussions but let me tell you something vivian you need to like you know let me see if i can put this in the camera you need to dust yourself for the for, for where you reach i think you know you need a round of applause because i see you there you're sitting in your store i love your branding i love the branding that i see behind me and i wish you know we didn't have to, you didn't get that letter saying 90 days extra to, to have people come and, and get the service. Because if you know, if I mean, if everybody heard what you just said, is that you're selling the same products. But what differentiates this is that service, is that person to person relationship. And I get, I get what you're saying that you're trying to bring the roots and culture from the West to Canada. And I endorse that. Uh, Matt. Bridget, how long now have you been in the cannabis industry, brother? Well, uh, the cannabis industry from a legal perspective <clears throat> hasn't been around too long. Well. That's not true. Yeah, cannabis has been legal for medical purposes. Yeah, yeah the yeah. sector has been, like, mm -hmm. we've been able to get legal cannabis in Canada for over t for about 20 years now. Um, but really, the the um, business component of it is only four or five years old. So, you know, it's about that time, somewhere in there, four years or so. And um, as I'm sure Vivian can attest to this for sure, things move incredibly quickly in the legal cannabis industry. So four years is, is like 10 and her, ten. you know, her j January to now is pro probably, it probably feels like three years. Um, yeah. I, I was, I, you're saying, you know, it's great that Vivian has made it this far, and I was, I was actually thinking the same thing. I, we deal with so many people who, you know, all the way from companies that are opening many stores to someone who wants to open one to people who are just thinking about opening a store, and mm -hmm. so many people don't get this far because for, for, they give up, they run out of money, they run into too many procedural roadblocks, and it's great to see Vivian's store built. Um, it's excellent. You know, has met all the requirements. Really sitting on our hands, having to, you know, and that's unfortunate and, and terrible. But it's great to see that she's ticked all the boxes and accomplished all the things she needs to do to get open, except something completely outside of her control, which is someone to show up at her store and say, "Looks good." Um, yeah. You know, that's the missing piece. So it's it's really great to see that because. Um, there's been people before her, for sure. We all see how many stores mm -hmm. are open. There's a lot of people behind her. Um, and so uh, it's, it's. Um, I, I do like, I like when 
any of my clients open stores. I like seeing people who are not my clients, especially mom and pop, sole proprietors. And, you know, Vivian's made a number of very interesting points that don't necessarily lend itself to this topic today, but things about the culture and the roots. And I'm hoping we're going to see a lot of that when all the stores get open, because some of the stores, many of the stores maybe are not necessarily about the history and the culture. They might think they are, um, but they're not. And I don't profess to be deeply entrenched long-term in the culture, but I, I can tell legitimate culture representation when I see it. <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's good. And the experience does matter because the products are all similar. And the way you treat your customers, the way you approach the education, the way you deal with people in the store, the way you present yourself and your staff in the store, those are all the things that are going to make people successful, not necessarily the sign on the front of the door so it's great to see more stores coming up that um, advocate for that and educate for that as opposed to you know at a very basic level slapping some ipads down um, yeah. on a table and letting people order from a menu and you know giving about the th digital it's to see that and i i had read you know before trey you and phil contact me i read vivian's story as well um, and so it's it's great to know that it seems so far, but you know at the same time she is so close. That's really great for yeah. for me to see, and I'm I'm hoping we see a lot of changes, even if they're small, with the process to speed things up um, for yeah. other people. And there's all kinds of other changes. I'd like to see delivery come back on a full time basis for a private. Yeah, curbside, curbside. I curbside don't also. know. That's another example. Why did we take it away? Like it's, it wasn't to be put that take it away because that wasn't the intention. How about you explain to people that invested time and resources to uh, be able to do delivery and curbside why they can't do that anymore? Just tell them. No one's come out and said, here's the reason that we're not doing this right now. And so I'd like to see things change like that. But it's, it's with all the challenges and difficulties, um, mm -hmm. sometimes you got to step back and think, and I don't know if you guys have heard this, you probably have, but you know, cannabis just went from being illegal to essential fan of two. So all this still is overall on the whole, a great thing to see that people like Vivian can open a store, can get into business, that oh, yeah. cannabis is legal and that she can pursue her passion, you know, but let's just keep oh, yeah. working to improve the system, whether that's the application system or the education system or whatever the case is going to be to make the system for business owners and consumers and the government and everyone better than it is we can always strive to improve continue that anyway. that's why we're having these discussions that's why we're having these discussions thank you so much hey hey uh vivian let me ask you a question if if they said to you you know that you could have opened your store how long ago could you have actually opened your store let me just ask you that in your within your time frame and your schedule uh, if they had given you the go ahead uh, about when how, how, how long now you think you would be open well we were actually planning because like i said we you're you're in the dark you actually don't know so and because we had um, construction stop so we had to stop and then it reopened again june 1st um, so that's when construction uh, we were able to really hit the ground running with construction. So I had given mm -hmm. my contractors, mm -hmm. security technicians, um, mill work, you know, a month. I need a month, you guys, because I don't want that the AGCO says you can go and I'm the one delayed. Holding so I was pushing up. and I'm the one holding up the process. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thankfully I had a fantastic team um, of um people that I worked with and mm -hmm. we we were going to be ready by uh, construction finished by the end of June and we were planning on having an event by mid-July to have our grand opening you know family and friend night then a grand opening and kick it off by mm -hmm. that time until I was told no it's not even yeah. gonna wow. it's pump, not even gonna break. happen <laughs> pump your brakes it's not that pump easy for brakes. you not that yeah. easy for you <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, you know this this whole experience again, Vivian. It, it's it's again, you know, 
I'm happy that we're sharing it. I'm happy that it's it's being broadcasted to the world. Do you see it, you know, I mean, let's say everything goes smooth and, you know, we get that date for the for the um for the middle of September. Well, the the Toronto Sun says what, the 20th? No, 28th or 29th, end of the September. 20, okay. So based on the Toronto Sun, let's say we we're doing that now. You know, is there any other hiccups that you think these people, you know, they can come around with? Matt, do you think anything else are we we're clear in the way now? All you need is that good to go and then we just launch and we have a big bash and we invite everybody down and we make the best of it. Because, you know, the last thing I want is if if you let's say the right person hears this and they reach out to you, Vivian, and they say, you know what? Saw this story on, on LinkedIn or wherever we share it on you know cannabis wiki. And, you know, this touched me. I'm, I'm going to take this to the next level. I'm going to talk to, you know, I'm t taking this to, to Premier Ford directly. Would you be ready to open ASAP? Definitely. Just another, um, we would just need another two weeks and we'd be ready to open. Wow. You hear that, Matt? We need, we need to, to, to shout loud and you need to, you know, tell, spread the word also in our communities. Guys, we have to, you know, as advocates, I'm looking at three advocates on the screen right now, and I'm sure many other advocates, millions around the world are going to be watching this program. I want us to all unite. I want us to support each other. I want us as a community to collaborate and just build each other. Because when we're building each other in this cannabis industry or this, this, this whole cannabis advocacy, um, it's just beneficial for the future. It's beneficial for all of us and, and for people who want to make money. Guys, I'm in Canada and I've seen money flowing in this industry like foolish, like water, as, as us Jamaicans say. It'll run like water. <laughs> but my thing is, I want it to be authentic. I want it to be true. I want it to be real. And I don't want 10, 15 years from now, you know, people are saying the, the pioneers of the industry, the mats of the industry, the Vivians of the industry, we didn't do it properly. So right now, guys, you know, the steps that, that you're currently taking, the fight that you're fighting, Vivian, I want you to, to keep your head up. You know, Matt, I, thank you so much for all of the, the support and the feedback. And, bro, I, I mean, you know, people should check out your LinkedIn and reach out to you directly for consultations and advice. I mean, bro, you, you have a big catalog. Um, Vivian, I want to, again, thank you so much for taking the time, for come share your story for you know pushing this to the forefront it's it's cannabis you know it still has a negative connotation in in many places of the world but at the same time we are the pioneers we are the one making some noise and try pushing it out and getting everybody to to get educated um, i was going to say edutained but get educated and also enter have um, be entertained in this uh on this topic um, is there any anywhere to reach out to you? Um, you have any you know social links, anything, Vivian, that you want to put out there? Anybody can follow you or reach out to you? Oh, definitely. They can follow us at um, on Instagram at Greenport Can. And just one thing to add, Trey. I know the AGCO has said that we can't sell cannabis, but that doesn't mean that we're going to keep our doors closed. We have uh, quite a few community-based events that we are planning over the next couple of weeks. So follow us on Instagram and you'll see all of those events because like I said, we're not, create, we're not opening up a store, we're building a community. So we're inviting people in before the AGCOs, you know, even though they've put a halt on us selling products. Um, we have a few community-based events that we're doing. We're going to be doing some fundraising for some of the organizations that um, we'll be supporting uh, throughout throughout the um, the time that we we are um, operating. Uh, so check that out. It'll be coming within the next couple of weeks. Nice, nice. Hey Matt, do you have any um, social links? Any anything you want to shout out? Anybody who want to reach out to you and get in contact with you, and you know probably even get some some you know, law, some, some legislative movements going on. What's your contacts, man? Yeah, usually the best, I think the, the most direct way is uh, my Twitter account is at Matt P. Maurer, M-A-U-R-E-R. -E um, it's my first name, middle initial, and, and last name. And from there, you'll be able to find my email address. 
address in my my bio or just google me it's 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 not too hard to find it guys thank you so much again this has been profiling with trey we have many more to come me and you well vivian matt we're going to be linking up again i guarantee we're going to be doing a follow-up and Vivian, we're going to be coming to cover that launch. You know, I'm, I'm, my producer is listening in the back, so uh, Phil, go ahead and, and schedule that in. Uh, anybody who wants to reach out to my producer, just email him at phil at cannabiswiki.com. That's phil at cannabiswiki.com. You know, we can set up, um, we'll share the, the contacts. If you want to reach out to Vivian, we'll share it. If you want to reach out to Matt, we'll share it. Guys, let's, let's build a community. Let's collaborate, you know. My, my ending, you know, I was working on an ultra for my first show and, and I wanted it to end like this. Let's keep the discussion going. Comment, you know, feel free to comment and talk about everything that you heard in the, in the discussion, in the comment section. Until next time, see you, stay, stay safe, stay up, enough love, enough respect. I'll do it perfect next time, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Greenport, Matt, respect, Cannabis Wiki. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Trey.